We're back. All right, part eight of five scams that have become so normalized we don't even realize they're scams anymore. You guys are gonna have to let me know in the comments if you're getting sick of this series. Personally, I'm not at all, but uh, you let me know what you think. With that said, this list is gonna be covering some of both the most brazen and the most controversial scams we've talked about yet. Am I going to rock the boat a little bit? Perhaps. Am I gonna anger some people? Most definitely. Do I care? No, <laughs> let's do it. Now, speaking of brazen scams, the first topic that we're about to cover is probably the most brazen, most outrageous, and most widespread scam in modern society, and that is data brokers. And it's very possible that you've never heard of data brokers before, but I can pretty much guarantee that they've heard of you. Data brokers are companies who collect and then sell your personal information to third parties for the purpose of marketing their products and services to you. You've most definitely experienced this when you were, let's say, scrolling on social media and started getting hammered with advertisements for products that you recently thought about or maybe discussed with somebody or Googled at some point, and all of a sudden they're just all over your feed. For example, in my case, my mortgage is coming up for renewal soon, and I've been reading a lot of articles about the predictions for interest rates in the coming year. And as a result of that, I've been getting absolutely slammed with advertisements from banks, from loan companies, even from local real estate agents, because thanks to data brokers, they know all about me. They know that I own a home, they know exactly what area I live in, and they know that I'm in the market for a mortgage. It's a little bit creepy, right? Well, I hate to say it, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. With pretty much every interaction we have nowadays, we're being tracked and surveilled by our phones, our computers, every smart device ever, sometimes even by our credit cards, who are compiling our personal information, organizing it in databases, and essentially building profiles about us that contain every sensitive detail you can imagine. They know pretty much everything there is to know about you, including your full name and address, your birth date, any previous places you've lived, your occupation, where you currently work and where you've worked in the past. They know your income, they know how much debt you have, they know how you spend your money and where you spend your money. They know your relationship status, your sexual orientation, your religion, your race, even your sensitive medical history. Everything is out there in the open, even if you don't know that it is. And as for whose hands that information winds up in and what they're ultimately gonna do with it, they'll never really know. I know this all sounds like a wild conspiracy theory, but it's 100% verifiable and true. Every place you've ever shopped, everything you've ever looked up online, it's all compiled in a database that's being sold to other people who are gonna weaponize it to market their things to you or to spam and harass you or sometimes to even do more nefarious things like steal your credit or hack your bank accounts. John Oliver actually did an amazing segment on this about a year ago, which I will link to in the description box down below. It's equally fascinating and horrifying, but I think it's a must watch. And well, if you're wondering how this is all possible, how this happens, it's thanks to something that you've probably heard of called cookies. Um, yum, yum, yum. You know when you go on a website and they ask you to allow or to reject cookies? Cookies are tiny bits of code that act as trackers for your online activity. So for example, when you Google the prescription that your doctor just gave you and you read up about its side effects on a medical website, cookies take note of that. And now they know what you've been diagnosed with and when, and that information is gonna be sold to other drug companies or maybe even to insurance companies who will use it against you. It's some real big brother type shit. But if you've ever tried to reject that prompt online to ask you to allow cookies, if you've ever tried to hit decline, you'll know that it's not that simple. In fact, it's very complicated. Rather than it just being a simple opt in or opt out, they'll bring you to a menu with dozens of little buttons to toggle on and off for each specific decision that you're supposed to make. And I don't know about you guys, I certainly don't understand it. I think most people don't understand it. And that's the entire premise, is they make it difficult on purpose, knowing that you're just trying to look at whatever website you're trying to look at. You don't want to spend 10 minutes going through the settings and trying to read through things you don't understand. And so the majority of us, myself included, are going to be a lot more likely to just hit accept and move on. We're private citizens and our information, the things we look up online, the things we purchase, the things we do, all of that information should stay private as well. We've probably all heard the saying that when something appears to be free, it's because we are the product and it's completely true. Data brokers make a fortune by collecting up our sensitive personal information, the things that we intend to keep private, and selling them to basically anybody who's willing to pay for them. And if that's not a scam, I don't know what is. But when I make these videos and we talk about these scams, you guys often leave me comments saying like, okay, I agree, that sounds awful, but what's the solution? And unfortunately, a lot of the times there isn't one. But when it comes to data brokers collecting and selling your personal information, there absolutely is a solution and it's today's sponsor, Aura. Aura does the hard work for you by searching for your personal information, notifying you about which data brokers have access to it, and then automatically submitting those opt-out requests on your behalf. Cleaning up your personal information not only reduces the number of spam calls and emails you get, but it also keeps you protected from hackers who might use your information to do things like break into your bank account or social media accounts or worse. Aura also comes with a bunch of additional built-in features to help protect you from the threats you don't see. Things like antivirus, VPN, identity theft insurance, and much more, all built into one app and all available for one affordable price. 
Aura is always on and working hard to keep you safe, so you can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. I very much value my privacy, and I know that you value yours too, so head over to Aura.com slash according to Nicole, or click the link below to get started with a free two-week trial. Thanks to Aura for sponsoring today's video. The second scam we're going to be talking about today is one that I want to approach delicately, and that is weight loss systems. I want to preface all of this by acknowledging that there are certain medical conditions that people have that can make it very difficult for them to lose weight, and I am not a doctor and I am not addressing people with those types of conditions. What we are going to be addressing today is just regular, everyday weight loss for your otherwise healthy person, and more specifically, the various systems and programs and products designed to try to make you feel like you need them to help you lose weight. When I've made videos in the past about saving money or getting out of debt, I've talked about how there's actually a very simple formula to achieve this. You either have to earn more or save less or both. And how you approach those things is really up to you, but those are really the only ways that you're ever going to get ahead financially. Well, as it turns out, weight loss is a very similar equation. You either just have to burn more calories or consume less calories or both. And again, how you approach that specifically, well, there's a million different ways you can do that. But really, it's that simple. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is simple. There's a difference. Calories are our body's energy source, and all of our bodies consume a certain number of calories just to keep you alive. So even if you're completely sedentary and you just lie in bed for the rest of your life, your body would consume a certain number of calories just to maintain your heartbeat and your organ function. But when we're active, when we move around, when we walk, when we work out, anything like that, those activities all burn a certain number of extra calories. What that obviously means is that if you're consuming more calories than you burn each day, you're going to eventually wind up gaining weight. Of course, the flip side of that is that if you are burning more calories than you consume, you're going to lose weight. It's just simple math at the end of the day. But simply telling somebody who wants to lose weight that they should just eat less is not very helpful advice, because if it was that simple, they would have just done it already. I mean, mathematically, it is that simple, but that's not an easy thing to do. There are many reasons that people wind up overeating, and simply telling somebody to stop overeating because it's causing them to gain weight is about as helpful as telling a smoker to stop smoking even though they know that it's not good for them. Like, if it was that simple, they would just do it. But any time that we as a human population have come across something that is difficult or something that is complicated, here comes capitalism to the rescue, right? Here comes all of these companies trying to sell you their product and their program saying that they're going to help you lose weight. There are dieting plans and books, there's protein shakes and smoothies designed to make you shit yourself skinny, there are supplements designed to suppress your appetite and meal prep services that give you this much food and tell you you should be satisfied with that. There's even a doctor who injects something into your ass. I'm not even joking, I don't know what it is he injects, but he puts injections into your butt that are supposed to help you to lose weight or cellulite or fat or something. I, I don't know. The vast majority of these weight loss programs have a few things in common. Their efficacy is questionable, their safety is even more questionable, they're very expensive, and they're totally unsustainable for most people. Realistically speaking, weight loss should be free because it doesn't cost you money to decide you're going to start consuming less calories. Really, the only expense that I can see being reasonable in a weight loss journey is maybe a gym membership or some sort of workout classes, I think that makes perfect sense. But paying these companies hundreds or even thousands of dollars for their unproven and often unsafe weight loss products doesn't seem like a very good idea to me. We could have an entirely different conversation about the predatory nature of these companies and how they're designed to basically make everybody feel insufficient, make you feel insecure, like there's something wrong with you so that they can sell you the solution. That's a tale as old as time that we see in many industries nowadays. But instead, let's talk about the fact that studies show that 80% of people who lose a significant amount of weight via a dieting plan or a weight loss product wind up putting the majority of that weight back on within 12 months. And the reason is that in all of these products, all of these programs, all of these systems, they're addressing the symptom, but not the cause. They're addressing the weight, but not why it's there. They're not addressing why it is that somebody might have trouble eating healthy or controlling their portions. And that's what really needs to be addressed here. In order for somebody to have healthy, sustainable, safe weight loss, it really has to be an entire lifestyle overhaul for most people. And I am certainly not qualified to give specific advice. I'm not a doctor, and this isn't something that I have firsthand experience with, so I absolutely don't want to overstep. But the point is that if you have a goal of losing weight and you want to do it in a way that is healthy and safe and sustainable, that doesn't look like a diarrhea inducing smoothie or shots in your ass or appetite suppressing vitamins. It looks like a lifestyle overhaul. Many years ago at an old job, I worked with a lady who was very overweight and she went through a dieting program where she was given all of these like handfuls and handfuls of pills and supplements and powders. I don't even know what they all were. She was taking handfuls of pills at work every single day and she was given these like frozen prepared meals to eat, which looked wholly unappetizing and tiny, tiny little portions. And I looked at them even as somebody who's on the smaller side and I was like, there is no way I would be full from eating that. I couldn't possibly imagine how this lady who was significantly larger than me could be satisfied from eating something so insignificant. And the point was that all of those pills she was taking were working to suppress her appetite so that she was satisfied with what was way, way, way too little food. 
She was very successful in the program. She lost a couple hundred pounds. She was very proud of herself. I remember her telling everybody that it cost her like $9,000, I think she said. It was very expensive. But then naturally, you can't live like this forever. You can't spend the rest of your life swallowing handfuls of pills and eating these little tiny frozen crappy meals. So what started to happen after she transitioned off of the plan? She started to gain weight back almost immediately. It was a waste of money, it was a waste of time, and she felt really bad about herself because she felt so accomplished and she realized that it wasn't gonna last. And personally, I think that's by design because the best way for these companies to generate profit is for you to come right back over and over and over again. Like most things in life, the weight loss industry is not designed to help you, it's designed to generate profit. And for that reason, I think it's a scam. Now staying on the topic of pseudoscience and woo-woo medicine and unsafe practices, let's talk about chiropractors. Chiropractors are not doctors and chiropracty, is it chiropracty, chiropracticy? Chiropracty sounds right. Chiropracty is not medicine. I'm gonna go with that. Chiropracty is not medicine and chiropractors are not doctors. Hey, editing Nicole here. So apparently the word is chiropractic and I know the word chiropractic, but it sounds like an adjective as in chiropractic services or chiropractic medicine, which isn't medicine, but chiropractic apparently is the noun that they use as well as opposed to the word chiropracty, which doesn't make any sense. But hey, before everybody jumps on me, here I am acknowledging my screw up, it's chiropractic. There you go, hope you're happy. Not only do chiropractors not have a medical degree, but chiropractic is considered pseudoscience under the medical umbrella. It's right up there with homeopathy, Reiki, and all sorts of other woo-woo, hippy-dippy bullshit. I'm gonna send you to my chiropractor. Hey, I thought real doctors hated chiropractors. The origins of chiropractic are wild. It all started with a guy named Daniel David Palmer who was, spoiler alert, not a doctor. He was a spiritual woo-woo guy back in the late 1800s who believed in magnetism and who was notably one of the most prominent early anti-vaxxers. He founded chiropractic under the assertion that the human body is an energetic force capable of healing itself from everything and anything without the use of medications, and that all medical conditions could be linked back to a misaligned vertebrae, which he called a subluxation, which once again, spoiler alert, is not a real thing. He basically claimed that he could cure anybody of any disease by performing a spinal readjustment, because that sounds plausible, right? Nowadays, chiropractors span a very wide spectrum, with some of them being completely immersed in absolute woo-woo wackadoodle nonsense and others less so, but it all still points to one fact, which is that chiropractic is not considered to be real medicine. So Homer, you think you can fix my sciatica? Hmm, I don't know what that is, so I'm gonna say yes. Now go limp. I'm limp. One, two, better not sue. <coughs> If you think that I'm being particularly harsh here, I would encourage you to do a quick Google search of the local chiropractors in your area and see how many of them offer other services that are completely nonsense. You'll see things like Reiki, hypnotherapy, bioenergetic practices, whatever the fuck that's supposed to mean. Many of them also offer other services that might actually be wholly legitimate, but that they're just unqualified to perform. Things like nutritional counseling or cognitive behavioral therapy. And the part of it that I find to be the most bizarre is that for decades now, chiropractors have worked tirelessly to try to legitimize their industry, to try to be taken seriously as medical professionals. But then everywhere you look, there seems to be chiropractors identifying themselves as doctors and commenting on things that they have no right to comment on. And we saw a ton of that during COVID when it seems like all of these doctors were talking about how dangerous vaccines were. And almost every single one of those doctors was a chiropractor who's not actually a doctor. And I wanna be clear that I don't speak about this from a point of an experience. I've been to chiropractors many times in my life, even actually starting when I was really young, I had some neck problems and some back problems that have persisted my entire life. But every time I went to a chiropractor, it never actually seemed to help. And anybody who I know who goes to chiropractors regularly has been going for years and years on end. And my point is, if it actually helps, why do you have to still keep going? Like if they can actually heal your back or your neck or your shoulder or whatever it is, then why haven't they healed you already? Why do you have to keep going? Now, I'll need to see you three times a week for uh, many years. I think in the best possible scenario, going to a chiropractor is a waste of time and a waste of money. But in the worst possible scenario, they can actually paralyze or kill you. And they have a handful of times by adjusting people's necks incorrectly, which makes me wonder, how do you adjust a neck correctly when necks don't need to be adjusted? I give up. Let's move on. Scam number four is holidays. I'm really up for blood on this one, it seems. I'm just gonna say it. I think that all holidays are fake. In part three of this series, I very delicately tiptoed around my thoughts on religion and why I believe that it's a scam, and I really played the cards lightly in that one. Many of you agreed with me, and many of you disagreed with me, and told me I need to find Jesus, and then unsubscribed, which I'm totally fine with. I think it's pretty funny, actually. Save me, Jesus! But today, I want to talk specifically about holidays. All holidays. Religious, secular, and everything in between. Regardless of what religion you do or don't follow, regardless of what culture you pertain to, what traditions you partake in, 
I think that holidays, like many other things, only exist for one real reason, and that is to sell you shit. I am shocked and appalled. If you think about it, there's actually a holiday of some sort every four to six weeks all year round, starting with New Year's, then we have Valentine's Day, Easter, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Independence Day. Here in Canada, we have Victoria Day for the Queen. Like, who gives a shit about the Queen? I don't know. There's President's Day, Memorial Day, Remembrance Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and then it just starts all over again. And what all of these holidays have in common is that you are supposed to buy things to celebrate. You're supposed to buy gifts for people. You're supposed to buy decor. You're supposed to buy huge amounts of food and to have gatherings. And I don't think there's anything wrong with having family and friends over to celebrate things. I think that's lovely. I think that's a really nice thing to do. But I completely reject the idea that you have to do it, that you have to do it at certain times to celebrate certain things, and that you have to go to a certain elaborate point. Guess there's no reason for you to come since you don't get Christmas presents. No, but I get Hanukkah presents for eight days. Too bad it's usually a dreidel or something lame like that. When New Year's comes along, everybody stocks up on alcohol and party favors and decorations and charcuterie boards and all that kind of stuff. They spend hundreds of dollars to celebrate the turning of a page of the calendar. Okay, fine. Then Valentine's Day comes around, which I'm wholly convinced was invented by Hallmark just to get you to buy cards and chocolate and crap that you don't actually need. My question has always been, if you love somebody, why do you need a reminder to tell them? Doesn't make any sense. But if you're in a relationship and you don't acknowledge Valentine's Day with your significant other, guaranteed there's gonna be a fight, so you have to do it. You feel obligated to do it. And Hallmark and all those companies are like cha-ching. I have the exact same sentiment towards Mother's Day and Father's Day. When it comes to the more religious holidays, I just don't understand them at all because they're all rooted in myths and bullshit, but fine, whatever. By keeping up the cycle of there being some sort of celebratory holiday every single month, stores can keep you shopping consistently, keep you spending consistently. Think about if the only holiday that people ever celebrated was like Christmas, for example. It means at Christmas, you'd go all out, you'd spend a whole bunch of money, you'd have a wonderful time, and then you wouldn't really have a reason to buy people gifts or spend money on decor or buy anything excessive for a whole nother year, which sounds wonderful to me. But of course, capitalism's not gonna let that happen. You gotta spend, spend, spend. So Christmas barely finishes and now it's New Year's and again, the whole cycle just starts over. I think that if you enjoy celebrating the holidays, whatever those holidays may be, you should totally enjoy celebrating them. Spend time with the people you love, do things that make you happy, enjoy having some time off work. I think that's the best part. I'm definitely not arguing against that. But I don't subscribe to this feeling of obligation of having to celebrate something every few weeks, having to buy people gifts for no reason other than the fact that a store tells you you're supposed to. Especially in the economic state that a lot of people are in today where they're so pressed for cash all the time and they're living paycheck to paycheck and barely making their bills, if that, it seems very predatory to me to try to convince somebody that their loved ones won't feel loved if they don't go and buy them this or that thing, that they're missing out on something that they're actually not really missing out on at all. Ultimately, like everything else, I say you do you, do what makes you happy, spend your money how you want to spend your money, but don't feel like you have to do something you don't want to do or can't afford to do just because Hallmark wants you to spend $8 on a greeting card which is absolutely absurd. And finally, staying on the topic of finances, let's talk about one of the biggest scams of all time, and that is credit scores. Now I say this from a point of somebody who has no personal resentment towards credit scores. I actually have very good credit. I'm very lucky in that way. I've had good credit my entire life. I never have really been in any debt other than having a mortgage. And so I've never been negatively affected by having a credit score. However, a lot of people can't say the same, and I don't think that it's actually fair because the way that your credit score is calculated makes absolutely no sense at all. Your credit score is intended to be a way for lenders to gauge how reliable you are in repaying the money you borrow. That sounds okay on the surface, right? But the way that your credit score is actually calculated doesn't reflect that in reality. If reliability and trustworthiness were the main metrics measured by a credit score, then your credit score would be positively impacted every time you paid rent, but it's not. It's positively impacted by you paying a mortgage, but not rent. Make it make sense. And the things that can cause your credit score to drop are not necessarily indicative of you being unreliable or untrustworthy at all. Things like applying for a new credit card will cause your score to drop even if you don't maintain a balance on that card. Things like signing up for a new phone plan or really anything that causes somebody to pull your credit report will cause your score to drop a little bit. Having a ton of available credit that you don't use is a good thing, but having only a little bit of available credit even if you don't use any of it is somehow a bad thing. Going into debt is a bad thing and obviously causes your score to drop, but then canceling a credit card to stop yourself from going into debt also causes your score to drop. Realistically speaking, maintaining good credit is not an incredibly difficult thing to do. It really does come down to you just making sure you're paying off all of your debts, paying your bills on time, staying on top of things, not buying things you can't afford. Like it is actually an easy thing to do in practice, but the point still stands that the way that it is calculated is not at all reflective of your actual reliability as a consumer. I'll use my credit card. A few years ago, I decided to do a bit of credit card churning. For anybody who doesn't know what that is, it's when you open up a new credit card to take advantage of a welcome offer or a sign-up bonus. 
And then once you get that bonus, you just close the account because you didn't actually want the card, you just wanted the bonus. So I did this over about six months. I think I opened about four credit cards where I used them, I paid them off in full every single month, I took the bonuses, and then I closed the accounts. During this time, I accumulated absolutely zero debt because I paid off the balances in full. Every single penny that I put on the card, I paid off in full immediately, so there was no balance. But even still, after doing this for about six months, my credit score dropped 80 points, which is massive. First, my credit score dropped just from applying for the cards. Every time that I applied for a card and they pulled my credit, my score would drop even though they approved me. And then when I called back later to cancel the cards, my score would drop again. So I'm like, hold on a second. I have just taken out credit cards. I spent money on them. I've paid it off in full showing that I'm 100% trustworthy. And then my score still drops. And the other side of this is that if people screw up when they're young and they make bad decisions and they get themselves into debt and they tank their credit score, even after years of rebuilding and doing better and paying things off, their credit score takes a very, very long time to bounce back. And you can be penalized for decisions you made five or six or even sometimes 10 years prior, all because the algorithm that calculates a credit score is completely illogical. Anyways, that is it for today's video. That is part eight of five scams that have become so normalized we don't even notice them anymore. As always, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on the five topics we discussed. And if there's any topics that you think I haven't covered in any of these eight videos so far, feel free to drop them in the comment section down below. If you enjoyed this video at all, please go ahead and hit that like button. Feel free to subscribe if you haven't done so yet. You can follow me on Instagram at according underscore two underscore Nicole. Other than that, thank you guys so much as always for watching. Take care and I'll see you next week.